Oh, San Kofa, high on the heavenly soar, my soul will fool back to you, back to yesterday's moon. Please remember me, back to yesterday's sun. Please rekindle me, rekindle my spirit into tomorrow, and high on the wind, San Kofa flies again and again. Oh, San Kofa, high on the heavenly shore, my soul will soon return to you, back to yesterday's moon. Please remember me back to yesterday's sun. Please rekindle me, rekindle my spirit into tomorrow, and high on the wind, San Kofa flies again and again. Sankofa flies again and again. Oh, Sankofa, high on the heavenly shore, my soul will soon return to you, back to yesterday's moon. Please remember me, back to yesterday's sun. Please rekindle me, rekindle my spirit into tomorrow, and high on the wind. Sankofa flies again and again. Sankofa flies again and again. Mm. Sankofa flies all around us. You see, Sankofa is your memories, the things, and the people, and the history behind you. And we are here in the middle of history. A living history as we sit here on these chairs that people for 300 years have sat on. My name is Valerie. I am an unabashedly proud black Bostonian. My family bought me a piece of this. I will never forget that. I need never to forget that. That is a pride and a power and a strength that I have to pass on. That's what Sankofa is. Taking the history moving it into the present and presenting it to the future, learning those lessons and hopefully not having to repeat them two or 10 times. But we're Bostonians, some of us, and we know how to repeat the same mistake 10 times. But we'll learn. We'll learn that our power and our connectedness can make change in this world. We will learn that our children are our part, our heart, and our future. We will learn that we have to work together. We will learn that singularly we can only do one thing, but collectively we can move mountains. And that's what we're talking about today. Within that is music. Music has followed us all through history, collectively moving us to create some change. I'm looking around here and I see you all know this song, maybe some of you don't, but collectively this is how we move. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around, turn me around, what? Turn me around, ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. I wanna keep on walking, keep on talking, gonna get to freedom land. That's why you're here. Good evening, <clears throat> excuse me, good evening everybody, and welcome to the Old South Meeting House. I'm Martha McNamara, the chair of the Board of Revolutionary Spaces, and I'm delighted that you are all here. First of all, I wanna thank Valerie Stevens for that incredible performance. Can we please give her another round of applause? She has set the stage 
Party for this evening's program, The Legacy of the Tea Party, Honoring Community Changemakers. Now, as many of you know, at Revolutionary Spaces, our mission is to bring people together to explore our nation's unfinished struggle to create and sustain a free society as evoked by the two national treasures we care for, the Old South Meeting House and the Old State House just a couple of blocks from here. This Saturday marks the 250th anniversary of the popular protest we know as the Boston Tea Party. In November 1773, three ships arrived in Boston Harbor carrying East India Company tea to be sold and taxed to the colonists. In response, people gathered in this glorious space to do something essential to the work of creating a free society. They engaged a diverse set of voices in passionate conversations about the meaning of political representation. So, 250 years ago, literally thousands of people from Boston and the surrounding area crowded into this space to begin the last round of these raucous debates over what to do about Britain's taxation policies. In recognition of their work, to elevate voices of their community and to bring about change, we are honoring three of our own community change makers. Change makers whose leadership has brought people together in dialogue and fostered a shared sense of purpose in order to transform their communities. I am honored to be a part of celebrating their fantastic work. Before we begin, though, I would like to acknowledge on behalf of Revolutionary Spaces that the sites we care for, the Old South Meeting House and the Old State House, stand on occupied and still unceded homeland of the Massachusetts people. We honor and respect the many Native peoples who are connected to this place, past, present, and future, including the Nipmuc, Massachusetts, and Wampanoag nations. We also acknowledge those whose bodies were exploited to build this nation, largely people of African descent. Revolutionary Spaces is committed to understanding and dismantling the destructive legacies of settler colonialism and slavery that are embodied in the histories of our buildings. We'd like to thank you all for coming tonight it is wonderful to look out and see new and old friends here, and also to be joined in community with people from Boston, from Massachusetts, and beyond. Now, to introduce our three honorees, please join me in welcoming Revolutionary Spaces President and CEO, Nat Chidley. Good evening. Good evening. There we go. Welcome to Old South Meeting House, this remarkable building which has served as a vital gathering place for the people of Boston since 1729. Tonight, we come together to remember events that happened in this very room 250 years ago to explore their meaning, and to remind ourselves that the work that began here remains unfinished. We honor three remarkable leaders for their commitment to changing our communities for the better. Arlene Isaacson, Rasan Hall, and Sean Simonini. And we dedicate ourselves, we rededicate ourselves, each of us, to the cause that stirred the people of Boston to action in December 1773. What was that cause? In our popular memory, the Tea Party was a protest over taxation. And it's true that the protesters believed, as James Otis put it, that taxation without representation is tyranny. But the crux of the matter was not taxation, 
Voters in Massachusetts, in colonial Massachusetts, taxed themselves more highly than most British subjects. Rather, it was representation. The people of Massachusetts did not have a representative in Parliament, the legislative body that passed the Tea Act. The measure thus posed fundamental questions about the political system to which they belonged. Whose voice mattered? How were the concerns of ordinary people to be heard? What recourse was available to those who were excluded from the decision-making process? These questions sat at the very heart of opposition to the Tea Act in 1773. And if they seem familiar to us today, they should. They're familiar because the American Revolution and the founding of the new United States did expand representation to include only some of those who had previously lacked it, while many others remained excluded from the political process. Their struggles to be fairly represented continued and are the thread connecting the tea protesters to each of us in this room and to every generation in between. If we train our focus not on taxation, but on representation, we can recognize a common purpose on the part of those in every generation who have labored to realize a more inclusive understanding of we the people, who have insisted that their voices too be heard. The inheritors of that work that began in this room 250 years ago were those who advocated for women's suffrage, for civil rights, for LGBTQ rights, and more. And we are proud to honor here tonight three accomplished changemakers who are part of this deep and important current in American life. As we gather in this room tonight, we are also called to reflect on the relationship between advocates and the communities they represent in the work of making change. Known to many of you, perhaps, are those dramatic events of December 16th, 1773, when scores of protesters boarded the Dartmouth, the Eleanor, and the Beaver, moored at Griffin's Wharf, and destroyed some 342 chests of East India Company tea. Less well-known are those three weeks of community meetings that preceded that fateful night, the meetings that Martha mentioned that were held right here at Old South Meeting House and were attended by as much as one third of Boston's adult population. Meetings at which a firm resolve and a shared sense of purpose were forged through dialogue and debate. You'll have to forgive me for the brief history lesson here, but I'm a historian. Uh, the first meeting took place on November 29th, shortly after the Dartmouth arrived in Boston Harbor. After much discussion, resolutions were adopted, refusing to allow the tea to be offloaded in Boston and calling for the Dartmouth and any other tea ship to be sent back to England with its cargo intact. These resolutions and the community's resolve were then swiftly tested the following day when the governor, Governor Hutchinson, labeled the meeting at Old South Meeting House illegal and refused to grant the ship a permit to exit the, har the, car the, exit the harbor with its cargo, without its cargo first being unloaded. The meeting, now calling itself the body of the people, debated how to respond and soon new resolutions were passed. Efforts to disband the meeting should be ignored. The ship's owner should petition the governor in person for leave to exit the harbor. This back and forth continued until December 14th, 200 year, 250 years ago, this very night, when the town gathered for a final series of meetings to consider what should be done if no compromise could be reached with the governor before December 17th. That was the date by, on which, by law, the Dartmouth's cargo would have to be brought ashore. There was no resolution calling for the destruction of the, of the tea recorded in any record, but the events of the night of December 16th made clear 
that a powerful consensus and a shared sense of purpose had been forged through the long weeks of meetings and community dialogue. The relationship between the meetings of the body of the people and the destruction of the tea are a powerful reminder that the real work of making change happens long before protesters take to the streets or to the decks of ships moored at the wharf in Boston, as the case may be. We are proud that we can honor here tonight three leaders whose work demonstrates that real change is made by those who bring their communities together, who empower others to speak, who listen, and who, through dialogue, are able to bring others together around a common purpose. Okay, the heart of tonight's speaking program will be remarks by our three remarkable honorees. Again, Arlene Isaacson, Rasan Hall, and Sean Simonini. Each will be introduced by one of our staff or board members, um, and uh, they will then take some time here at this podium to reflect in their own voice and from their own perspective on these themes of representation, community, and change. First, though, I do want to take just a quick moment to express my thanks to the many individuals and organizations who have made this program possible. Foremost among these are the staff and the board of directors of Revolutionary Spaces, who all year long have done the hard work of mounting a dynamic set of exhibits, programs, and experiences that connect our city's rich history to the urgent questions of today. So please join me in thanking them. I especially want to thank Meet Boston, our leading sponsor for tonight's program, and the Lowell Institute, who makes free public programs such as this possible. And I also want to recognize the many city, state, federal, and uh, even international officials who are in attendance with us here tonight um, to help us mark this important occasion. Tonight, we are celebrating the spirit of community, of representation, and of partnership. Revolutionary Spaces is incredibly fortunate to have representation at the federal, state, and local levels who believe in community and part. We set off several years ago with an ambitious plan to ready our properties and our programming for the 250th anniversaries of the Boston Tea Party and the American Revolution, and we knew it would only be possible in partnership and with support from our elected representatives. We have ambitious plans reflecting the physical needs of two colonial era properties, as well as the equally urgent challenge to elevate the meaning of the Old State House and Old South Meeting House, not just as historic sites, but as active conveners of elected and community leaders in a continued dialogue around democracy and citizenship. Our elected representatives and our community leaders have responded. So we're deeply grateful to Mayor Michelle Wu for her leadership, along with support from the Boston City Council, to dedicate funds for the old State House in the city's capital budget. We're also grateful that Representatives Aaron Mikelowitz and Jay Livingstone, who's with us here tonight, um, and Senator, along with Senator Lydia Edwards, have repeatedly championed our needs, whether it was pandemic relief, funding toward making our buildings fully accessible so that all visitors are able to fully enjoy our experience, preparing our 18th century buildings to weather the continued impacts of climate change or support for programs like this that connect the story of our nation's founding to the challenges and opportunities our community faces today. You have been incredibly gracious and generous with your time and steadfast support. Thank you. Okay, um, it is now my very great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Shigun Idowu, the City of Boston's Chief of Economic Development and Inclusion, 
for purposes of this evening's event, there is no better representative for Mayor Wu's administration. Um, a lifelong resident of Boston, Chief Ida Wu, uh, in his remarkable career, has been an exemplar of civic action and community engagement. From his work in support of police-worn body cameras, to his service as an NAACP Boston Vice President, Massachusetts ACLU Board Member, President of the Black Economic Council of Massachusetts, and his present role in Mayor Wu's cabinet. Chief Itawu has at every turn used his remarkable voice, his keen intellect, and his forceful will to bring community voice, perspective, and justice to the halls of power and decision-making across greater Boston and beyond. A change maker among change makers, I give you Shagun Itawu. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm not going to make a say it again. It's all right. Um, first of all, Nat, that was, I have to thank you for that uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to take you everywhere I go from now on. Um, <laughs> um, but I want to thank you, Nat, and Anne, and Martha, um, and the team at Revolutionary Spaces, um, uh, and especially want to call out uh, three uh, well, former colleagues, but good friends of mine, uh, Matt Wilding and Ed O'Connell, and depending on what day it is, Lou. Um, but I want to thank all of you. Um, I have to give you kudos for what you've done uh, with Revolutionary Spaces, uh, making uh, not only our history come alive, um, but ensuring that all of the, the diversity uh, that existed then and that exists now are truly represented. And um, I continue to be grateful for your intentionality in making sure that all the voices of Bostonians are truly represented in all the work that you're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, I um, was shared uh, by Nat. My name is Shagun Idawu. It's for the last two years, it has been um, my great and good fortune to be able to serve as the Chief of Economic Opportunity and Inclusion uh, for the city that I love and that I grew up in, the city of Boston. And tonight, it is uh, my privilege to be able to stand here on behalf of our Mayor, Michelle Wu, uh, to share a quick thought uh, on the importance of the occasion that brings us together. Uh, I want to at first congratulate the champions of inclusion, or as the late uh, civil rights legend, uh, Reverend Joseph Lowry, would have called you the chaplains of the common good, um, Arlene and uh, Sean and my eternal brother, Rasan Hall, on your much-deserved recognition tonight. Um, my grandfather, the Reverend Earl Lawson, once uh, told me that the secret to a great speech uh, is to have a good beginning and then a good ending, and then to have the two as close together as possible. Uh, and so tonight, because I've um, used uh, four of my seven minutes uh, congratulating and thanking everybody in the room, uh, I think I'm going to deliver on that, uh, on that promise. You'll hear the greatest speech you ever heard tonight. Um, so as I stand here this evening, I cannot help but transport myself 150 years ago to December 15th, 1873 when a little ways down the road here, more than 3,000 Bostonians jammed themselves into the hall donated long before by Peter Faneuil to join Lucy Stone and Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison and Mary Livermore in observing what Wendell Phillips had called the unfinished nature of the revolution, whose roots were pure and would provide further harvest, but whose fruits had shut their eyes on one side to women and on the other side to the Negro. What they were demanding that day, as they were 250 years ago, was representation for the masses of people who had been left out of the sunlight of Liberty's July, and as Dr. King would have said, were left standing amid the piercing chill of an alpine November. Representation was, of course, a central point in the 18th century battle of wills between the residents of Boston and the British Empire. Taxation was the means by which the king and parliament sought to control the American colonies, but the real issue at hand was representation. Residents found themselves asking, who speaks for me? How will my voice be heard? What of my rights? 
These are enduring questions, and they continue to inform our work as policymakers and doers in Boston and beyond, as they must if the ideals brought forth by the people of Boston 250 years ago are to stand the test of time and provide access and power to all of the people of our city, of our commonwealth, and of our country. It's important to note that we gather this evening in a powerful place, full of power in 18th century Boston and full of power today. Two short blocks away from here was the seat of British power in colonial Boston. Known as the old state house today, it was then known as the townhouse. And it was from that seat of power that the king's representative, the royal governor, ruled the Massachusetts colony. It's worth noting that the royal governor's power was virtually absolute. Answering only to the king, the royal governor had veto power over all of our House of Representatives. I'm smiling because I'm not gonna share this with Governor Healy of what the power of the governor was in that day. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but the, the, the governor, there was no provision to override the governor's veto. Uh, and the governor also had the authority to disband the elected representatives at will. So um, anyway, rep, again, Rep. Livingstone, I'm not going to share this with the governor. Um, the veritable king of Massachusetts is how the governor stood. Their authority and standing was above challenge or question until one day it wasn't. And as it's already been shared, meeting here at Old South, this revolutionary space, you like that play on the words there, the people of Boston came together to question and challenge the authority of a king and country to impose its will upon her citizens without their having any say in the lawmaking process. In coming together here, the people of Boston found power in their collective voice. Coming together here, the people of Boston found the strength to stand up for their rights, the strength to turn words into action, the strength to dump the tea, yes, but to likewise change the world order. When that first crate of tea, when the tip of that crate touched the waters, the ripples that were created have come to transform generations. And while there are some today who may clumsily attempt to denounce this act while celebrating the virtues that informed it, I say that they're an oxymoron. When, when rights are denied, one cannot meet, be more devoted to order than to justice. We must not rush to condemn the sometimes passionate reactions of a group of oppressed people to the visible reminders of their oppression. For life is the property of the living, and it is this property that we must seek to protect above all else. The Reverend James Freeman Clark, a Unitarian minister, said at that gathering in 1873 that the Boston Tea Party was an illegal proceeding. It was breaking the law. It was plainly a riot. It was an offense against order, yes, but it was breaking the lower law and obedience to the higher law. Great Britain recognized the threat in this symbolic act, and from across the wide Atlantic, she sent her troops to lay siege to this old Boston town, but in many ways, she was too late. The seeds of revolution had been planted and had taken root. Now, looking back, it is easy to think that the people of Boston saw the road ahead and were intent on creating a representative democracy in which the people would be the source of power. But of course, they could see no farther ahead than we can see today. But they knew right from wrong justice from injustice, freedom from tyranny, subjection, and suppression. They knew with Bayard Rustin so many years later that to accept an injustice is to perpetuate it. They knew it in these seats, they knew it in these seats, and they knew it in these seats. But the road continues on, and as we today struggle to see the future to come, we must remain true to the ideals fought for in colonial Boston and beyond. Not just the words, but the meaning. Not just for the privileged few, but for the many. In carrying out our responsibilities as elected and appointed officials and as residents of this commonwealth, we must strive to answer those enduring questions brought forth in the fire of revolution. Who speaks for me? How is my voice heard? Believing always with 
that great legend, Fannie Lou Hamer, that nobody's free until everybody's free. On behalf of Mayor Wu, I thank all of you for being here tonight. Thank you, Shagun. That was really wonderful. Um, again, I'm Martha McNamara, board chair of Revolutionary Spaces, and I am honored to be able to introduce our first community change maker, Arlene Isaacson. Now, most of us learned of the Boston Tea Party in grade school. We were taught that the British policies of the day were unfair and that in anger and frustration, the good people of Boston rose up in protest of taxation without representation and destroyed the tea. It was, we learned, all about the tea and all about taxes. Perhaps, though, more of our class time should have focused on the matter of representation. For most of the 18th century, the social and legal status quo in Massachusetts was rigid and unyielding, with deference and obedience to one's superiors, whether as a matter of class, gender, religion, or politics, was most decidedly the order of the day. The thousands of people who gathered here at Old South 250 years ago were willing to challenge the status quo because they could see beyond at least some of the centuries old social mores and imagine a government with more representation than they had ever experienced. As we sit here in 2023, it is important to remember that our founding generation did not ultimately agree on who had the right to representation but they left us with a set of enduring questions, many of which Shagun has already raised, about representation that we continue to grapple with. How is my voice heard? Who speaks for me? Where do minority rights lie in the face of majority rule? Arlene Isaacson has spent her entire professional life challenging the status quo and asking those very questions. She has not simply raised awareness of the current concerns of those feelings and bearing the weight of society's expectations and norms, but she has led the way in building the political support and will necessary to change people's lives for the better. Arlene is co-chair of the Massachusetts GLBTQ Political Caucus. She's a disruptor in the best sense of the word. She has lobbied for every major LGBTQ plus issue in Massachusetts, including the groundbreaking 1989 gay and lesbian civil rights bills, makes me a little emotional, <laughs> and domestic partner benefit, partnership benefits for Massachusetts public employees. Arlene's history of impassioned community engagement and civic action has included fights in support of LGBTQ plus parental rights, anti-bullying bills, hate crimes bills, transgender rights, HIV AIDS legislation, and the banning of conversion therapy for minors. She has that rare gift of being able to see beyond the current state of play and to chart a course to get us all to that better, fairer, more just place as a community and a world. And a world. For instance, Arlene was at the forefront of the legislative battle for marriage equality helping to make Massachusetts the first state in the nation to defeat a marriage equality ban. Never afraid to step up and be heard, Arlene has worked at every turn to work for freedom, justice, and equality. And tonight, in the spirit of the Boston Tea Party, we honor a true community change maker, Arlene Isaacson. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, very kind remarks. It's, 
it's an honor to be here tonight. And, and just as important, it's an honor to have been able to work for so many years on legislation with so many incredible activists and allies. Now, personally, most of my friends don't know this, but I'm actually kind of queer for history. And I, I'm embarrassed to admit that I did not realize how important this particular venue was to the actions of the Boston Tea Party and all the planning that preceded it. So it's been wonderful to learn about it. And at O'Connell, thank you for the wonderful tour that you gave me of this building earlier, because it's been fabulous to learn it. The, uh, by the way, for those of you who, who are here tonight but not yet members of Revolutionary Spaces, you really ought to be, because <laughs> <laughs> they run some amazing programs. Now, I am, as an activist, I am not a tea-tossing kind of activist. I, I tend to use words more than uh, tossing uh, to advocate for the things that are, I believe, important. Many people don't realize just how long it took the LGBTQ community to win some of the battles that uh, were just named a moment ago, and how many activists it took to win those battles. Whether it was the 17-year battle for what was then called the Gay and Lesbian Civil Rights Bill, an anti-discrimination measure that actually added two words, sexual orientation, two words, to an existing statute, 17 years it took. Or that it took over 10 years for an anti-discrimination measure for the trans community to pass. And that it took 10 years to defeat a ban on marriage equality, even though we ended up being the first state in the nation to do so. And it started in 1998, though many people don't even realize that. The list goes on and on like that. Most of these legislative victories were the result of years of hard-fought work by large numbers of people. To borrow from a, or to plagiarize a well-known phrase from others, it takes a village. And it took a village. It took a village of thousands of volunteers and activists from the LGBTQ community including from the days when we weren't called an alphabetical name, when we were happy to be called gay instead of homo. And it's important to remember that numerically, there were not enough LGBTQs and certainly not enough out ones to win these legislative battles. We needed allies in every one of those fights, friends, families, coworkers, neighbors, etc. And we needed political leaders, like the ones who I'm told are or will be here tonight, uh, Lydia Edwards, Aaron Milkowitz, Jay Livingstone. We needed legislators and elected officials with guts and gumption, with caring and commitment for justice. We needed elected officials who were willing to take votes that they thought might damage their political careers, and in some cases might even have done so. And. We needed elected leaders who were willing and able to rethink the lessons they had been taught in their childhoods, taught their entire lives, that LGBTQ people were evil, that we were sinful, that we were loathsome, that we were disgusting, ungodly, perverts. Lessons they'd learned from their families, their religion, their cultures. Many elected officials had to go, had to challenge themselves in the most difficult of ways, to ask questions like, should I rethink all that I was raised to believe in regard to this issue? Do I dare to change my mind? For those of you who know the musical South Pacific, you may remember that there's a famous song in it that starts, you've got to be taught to hate and fear, you've got to be taught from year to year, it's got to be drummed in your dear little ear, you've got to be carefully taught we should never underestimate the guts it takes to realize you were wrong, to realize that you need to change your mind, your views, your votes. It's not easy, but it is essential. We would never have won the battles that we did on gay and lesbian civil rights and marriage equality and trans rights and conversion therapy. We would never have won without elected leaders who were willing to challenge how they were raised and what they previously thought were the right things to do. Now, perhaps some of you are familiar with the concept of the butterfly effect. 
That's where a small action like the beating of a butterfly's wings can have ramifications that are a million times more powerful than that later on down the pike, than the original bat beating of their wings. That's what political movements are made of. That's what legislative victories are made of. And so to those of you who helped in any way, large or small, who came out of the closet or supported someone who did, who had tough conversations, tough but important conversations, to persuade people, whether it was your cranky old bigoted uncle at Thanksgiving or an elected official in the state house, and to the elected leaders who took positions and votes that may have felt perilously tough, and to those of you who were the butterflies whose wings helped to make these things, these advances happen, my sincere and heartfelt thanks. You helped to make the world better, to change the world, to make it more fair, to make it more just. You are a change maker. And very importantly, you can continue to be a change maker if you so choose. The concepts of the LGBT equality movements were or seemed to be revolutionary, but the ways in which we won this equality were more about evolution than revolution. It took dogged persistence of many people to persuade folks to change their minds, as it always does take dogged persistence. So let that be the lesson, please, for all of us, for the times in which we now live. It's sometimes not easy to persuade people to change their minds, to move towards justice, especially when people are afraid, when they're fearful. But it's always worth trying. And so in that regard, I, I very gratefully accept this recognition on behalf of the very large village of activists and allies who work together to help build a better society. Thank you. My name is Nancy Taylor. I serve on the Board of Revolutionary Spaces. I'm also the Senior Minister Emeritus of Old South Church in Boston, now located in Copley Square, but this was our second home. And having hosted the Boston Tea Party, when we do occasionally get up to good trouble these days, I like to say we've been getting into hot water for a long time. As the tea crisis unfolded, Bostonians grew increasingly angered and frustrated by the injustices that they experienced. But they faced a formidable adversary, a king and a parliament backed by an army and navy that were the envy of the world. The people asked, how do we address this injustice, this threat to our representation? Are we ready? Are we able? to endure the repercussions of our actions. And the key word here is we. Before anyone tossed that first chest of tea overboard, thousands of people had met here in this meeting house for weeks of dialogue. Here they held forth, debated, and strategized. Here, over time, disparate views began to coalesce. Here, fear turned into courage. Here they summoned the will to call out and face down the powers and principalities. Our second honoree knows about that kind of coalition building, and he rarely misses a chance to speak truth to power. The Reverend Rasan D. Hall, Esquire, is the president and CEO of the Urban League of Eastern Massachusetts a 104-year-old organization committed to empowering communities and to changing lives. Rasan and the Urban League work to overcome racial discrimination, social marginalization, sexual and domestic violence, unemployment, 
and other barriers to social justice and economic opportunity. And they do it the old-fashioned way. They deliver programs and services where people live and work. They empower the un- and underemployed to improve social, economic, and political dynamics of their own communities. Changing the world around him is nothing new to Rashan. An innovator and community builder by nature, he is a graduate of Northeastern's School of Law. Following eight years as an assistant district attorney in Boston, Rasan became deputy director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. In 2015, he joined the American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts as the director of its racial justice program. In that capacity, Rasan has led groundbreaking grassroots efforts both to litigate issues and to educate people, both the powerful and the marginalized, for civil liberties and criminal justice reform. With respect to civic action and engagement, Rasan Hall doesn't just talk the talk. This good man walks the walk. A husband and father, a lawyer and ordained minister, an activist and organizer, and not least, a past candidate for public office. God bless you, sir. <laughs> Rasan gives voice to those facing injustice. He brings the power of his considerable intellect, his large heart, and his indomitable spirit to righting this world's wrongs. The embodiment of a community change maker it is my distinct honor to present to you the good Reverend Rasan D. Hall, Esquire. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you. Uh, Reverend Taylor, thank you so much uh, for that kind and generous introduction. I am deeply humbled and moved by that. Uh, to Martha and Nat and the rest of the Revolutionary Spaces team, thank you for all uh, that you have done and thank you for this honor. Uh, to the other honorees, Arlene, my dear friend and comrade, we've had many battles up on the State House and sometimes even in the ACLU office, uh, but you're somebody that I always want to be in the trenches with. Um, and to Sean, even though I'm just meeting you, I can sense the energy and power and commitment that you bring uh, to change. Uh, to Chief Iduwu, my man, my brother, it's so wonderful to share this space with you. I am surprised that you're not up here receiving an award of your own because you have so many accolades behind the work and the commitment that you have done. Extend my thanks and greetings to the mayor uh, as well. Uh, to Sister Valerie, where are you? Thank you so much for invoking the spirit of the ancestors and setting the table for what needs to happen tonight, but also moving forward. Uh, to our elected officials, thank you for the work and service that you have been committed to uh, over the years and our friendship and labor uh, to make this Commonwealth better for everyone. And last but not least, uh, to my dear wife, Trinette, uh, my comrade in the struggle, my A1 from day one, uh, my Coretta to my Martin, my Betty to my Malcolm, uh, I love you and thank you for all your love and support and encouragement on this revolutionary journey of love. It's an honor to receive this award. In thinking about revolutionary spaces, I think one of the greatest revolutionary spaces is in the hearts and minds of people. Uh, I come out of a revolutionary lineage of great people who have stood against oppression uh, and injustice here in this city, the spilt blood of Christmas addicts not too far from here to spark 
a revolution. The revolutionary idea of a little black girl named Sarah Roberts wanting to go to a school that was much closer to the one that she was forced to because separate but equal, which was language that this Supreme Judicial Court used that was later adopted by the nation's Supreme Court, was here in this commonwealth and here in this city. Shadrach Minkins, a self-emancipated black man from the South who came up here and fought the rendition back to the South. Phyllis Wheatley, who occupied this space. William Monroe Trotter, Shirley Owens Hicks, Mel King, I come out of a long lineage of revolutionary people who have fought the good fight for themselves, their community, and for the betterment of this city, for this commonwealth, and this nation. And all of the things that they did at the time were seen as unpopular. I just learned from my good friend Matt that the Tea Party at the time was seen as unpopular, but it's amazing what narratives can do to change our understanding of uprisings and resistance and the movement of people. I'm reminded of the sit-ins that happened in the South where black people were subjected to extreme indignities and now we revel with great honor and respect for those who made those sacrifices. I'm reminded of the struggle and sacrifice and resistance of Dr. King and so many others who at the time were perceived as disruptors, people who were seen as not wanted. But now people sin, tend to throw out the quotes of Dr. King out of the very same mouth that condemns and chastises the very rights that Dr. King fought for. It's amazing how powerful narratives can be to shift our understanding and appreciation of revolutionary ideas and revolutionary actions. I also come out of a long tradition of revolutionary embraces because it was the embrace of community that allowed so many of those movements in the past for people to stand together and resist oppression. Just like the meetings that were held here, it was the coalitions that came together to organize, to strategize, to plan, to envision, and to inspire. That is the embrace that I come out of. That is the embrace that I take with me in the work that I have done and the work that I do. Whether it was fighting for police reform or whether it was arguing to have more representative districts during the redistricting process or trying to have school busing districts that did not disproportionately impact black children in the city of Boston. It was that embrace of community that I took with me and that I stood with that was revolutionary and that led to change. The greatest revolutionary space is in the hearts and minds of humanity. And so, as we stand here comfortable, we cannot rest on our laurels, and we cannot lose that revolutionary edge when democracy is threatened throughout our nation, when women's reproductive rights and bodily autonomy of people is compromised and is legislated away, we cannot rest on our laurels and we cannot lose that revolutionary edge. When the history of a people who were the backbone of this nation are being erased out of textbooks and cannot be taught, we cannot rest on our loyal laurels or turn away from that revolutionary edge because the greatest revolutionary space is in the hearts and minds of the people. So we need to continue to live into that revolutionary lineage of people who have stood up and resisted. We need to fight and create and shift the narrative of the things that are seen as disruption and resistance as the things that are transformative and making us better. We need to continue to be involved in that revolutionary embrace and bring more and more people together. And lastly, we must continue to do what the prophet Micah once said, to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God because the greatest revolutionary space is within the hearts and minds of humanity. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. My name is Ed O'Connell, and I am the Civic Engagement Manager here at Revolutionary Spaces, and I'm certainly pleased to be with you all this evening. The patriots who dumped the tea and sparked a revolution after leaving this revolutionary space in which we gather this evening were not all of the type we often think of when we hearken back to those heady days of prospect, protest, and change. They were not all white wig statesmen in the making or the grand orators of the day, nor were they necessarily the leading literary lights, legal scholars, or political philosophers of the moment. In fact, most were members of the working classes of colonial Boston, tradesmen and apprentices, dock workers and deckhands, shoemakers and sailors. They were decidedly among those whose voices were rarely, if ever, heard in the places where po public policy decisions were being made in 18th century America. Notably, many of them were young. In fact, many of the Tea Party participants were teenagers, and very few were over the age of 40. Yet they were at the vanguard of a movement that truly changed the world. Youth voice and civic action are at the heart of the work of our final honoree this evening. Sean Simonini is the founder of the Massachusetts Association of Student Representatives, an organization that uplifts and empowers students serving on local school committees across the Commonwealth. As a school committee student representative himself, Sean saw firsthand the value of student voice and perspective in shaping policy in the realm of public education. Representing that oft-times marginalized constituency on his own town school committee at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, Sean set to work creating a statewide network of young people committed to elevating student voice and active engagement in the civic life of their respective communities and our state as a whole. Sean rightly believes that students are essential partners in building better school environments and uniting communities around our common pursuit of a more accessible and impactful educational experience for all. Having recently served as a legislative aide on Beacon Hill, Sean is presently leading a youth-driven effort in support of financial literacy in our K-12 schools. Sean also directs communications and social media for the National Student Board Member Association and is a valued member of the Massachusetts Youth Activism Collective. Now a college freshman, Sean is also a youth leader in the Massachusetts Civic Learning Coalition, of which Revolutionary Spaces is a proud and active participating organization. Sean's work shows us how each generation must take up the task of grappling with the meaning of representation and what it takes to have one's voice be heard in the civic realm. He is a shining example of what a commonwealth committed to civic education and engagement can bring forth. A community change maker of the highest caliber and the most recent vintage, I give you Sean Simonini. My, oh my, Ed, I am flattered. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. I appreciate it a ton. A mentor of mine used to say to me, Sean, however you choose to serve the public, however you seek to leave this world better than you found it, never do it for the recognition. Well, with that note, my first bit of thanks has to go back to Ed, the incredible civic engagement manager here at Revolutionary Spaces, for going out of his way and taking the time to recognize me, the association, and all of the hard work that we've been doing to uplift youth voices here in the Commonwealth. I also would not be here tonight if not for the help of the amazing leadership team of our association who has come all the way out to join us. So please give them a round of applause for all of their hard work. Thank you. I also want to thank my fellow honorees, Rasan, Harleen. I recognize that you two are both working tirelessly to uplift the unheard voices in your communities as well. And although we sometimes work on different issues, I think there's a common thread to be found here. And it is an absolute honor to be here being recognized alongside both of you two leaders. I also want to thank our distinguished guests for making this night so special. In addition to the rest of the Rev Spaces team, some legislators, members of the Boston City Council, 
Chief Iruwa, thank you for being here on behalf of the mayor's office. We appreciate that a ton. And thank you to all of the members of the audience. This gathering and this crowd makes all of this work truly worth it. You know, two years ago, when I was elected to serve on my hometown school committee as a student representative, I could have never imagined the challenges that we were going to face. At a time when our society was still wrestling with the peaks of the pandemic, students across the state had been thrust into debates between the balance between freedom and safety, liberty and security, both in Billerica, where I grew up, and across the state as we founded the association. And although it was difficult, and it's sometimes scary, I held firmly onto my conviction that in order for any system to effectively make decisions, it must account for the experiences of those that it directly affects. And I knew that this meant that we needed students, not just talking at the school committees, but working together with them. Their voices, their concerns, and their experiences deserved to be represented. And as we begin to realize the gap between that hope and the reality on the ground, we wanted to build out a promise to every community in this commonwealth that the recipients of the educational process would have a say in enhancing its governance. As such, we came across the two key questions that any trailblazers find themselves asking. If not us, then who? And if not now, then when? And here we are today, continuing to live out that promise on school committees across the state. And as we gather here tonight on this hallowed ground of the Old South Meeting House, I cannot help but make a connection between the movement that we've started giving youth a voice and the movement that was molded here in this very building. You see, the revolution and its after effects came about as an ember that was fanned into a flame by regular people like you, like me, and like the countless students serving on school boards across this state, relentlessly pouring passion into the belief that together we are stronger and that collective words and collective action can make meaningful change. Synergy tells us that we are greater than the sum of our parts, and representation is the embodiment of that synergy which we seek. 250 years ago, Bostonians came together as a community to find common ground, to stake a claim to representative government, and ultimately, to find that synergy. And it was in this space, this revolutionary space, that the people of Boston exercised the power of shared voice versus a king and a country who were determined to keep them in their place. We are here today because they spoke truth to power and exercised that power to find their right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. In doing so, they taught us that words matter and that when words inspire action, incredible things can happen. But I would be remiss not to note that in this modern day, I cannot claim success in this movement alone. It takes a visionary to set a path, but it takes a village to actually lay the pavement. And too often in history, I think that we recognize the names of the few on behalf of the many. And if it were up to me and if I had the opportunity, there would be hundreds of people being recognized alongside me tonight. Every single person who believed in this student-led movement from the very beginning. And when I think about that belief, I think back to my time as a student representative and how nothing brought me more pride than the enthusiasm of my peers and knowing that there was someone their age representing their interests throughout the district. I think we need that energy. We need that enthusiasm and we need that synergy now more than ever. As we turn to face some of the greatest challenges that this country, this world, and its people may ever face. And yet still, nothing gives me more hope than the dreamers, than the visionaries and the believers, who every day are fanning those embers of solutions into flames of action, just as our community did 250 years ago. And just as they did then, we too will build a better tomorrow together, passing the torch from one hand to the next. And as we close, I recall a quote from that era that strikes me, from none other than Benjamin Franklin, born right across the street in a congregant of this old South meeting house. Ben said that there are three kinds of people in this world, those who could be moved, 
those who could not, and those who could do the moving. Each day we must choose which one we shall be. And when I look out into this crowd, I see doers, I see shakers, and I see movers. And Ben believed that when enough of us came together and rose up as movers by coming together in sacred spaces like these, in support of a shared voice behind fairness and justice, the revolution would be destiny. And I think we need a little bit more of that right now in this moment. Some more revolutionary people and some more revolutionary spaces. And so on this 250th celebration of the Boston Tea Party, I am honored to be here among you. I'm grateful to be recognized, and I cannot wait to continue working together to build a better commonwealth, a better country, and a better tomorrow together. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you um, to all of our honorees this evening. Um, I need to announce a small change to the program, and it's very fitting. Um, so our next speaker was going to be Representative Aaron Michlowitz um, to speak a little bit about the power of place. Um, and he has let us know that he is caught in a city that is gridlocked by protest. So very appropriate. Um, so we're going to go out of order here in the hope that he might still make it before we close the program. So what I'd like to do at this time is invite all three of our honorees to return to the stage um, and also our civic engagement manager, Ed O'Connell, to come back to the stage um, because we'd like to share a token of appreciation in recognition of the fantastic work um, that all three awardees have done. Ed, will you do the honors? Each box contains a key, a symbolic key to Old South Meeting House. I'm sorry you won't be able to come and let yourselves in at any time, um, but it means something to us. It means uh, that we see a deep connection between your work and this place. Um, and it also stands for what we're calling a gift of space, which is the opportunity um, that we're extending to all three awardees to use this space to host um, their own gathering, either here at Old South Meeting House or at the Old State House at any time in the next two years uh, with no rental charge, to use these spaces in order um, to do the fantastic work that you do. So we look forward to having you back. Um, and I wanna ask all of you to please join with me one more time as we recognize our remarkable awardees and thank them for their service. Okay, thank you all for being here. I just wanna close with a few thoughts and really a call to action for all of you. So tonight's commemoration marks just one step in a journey that we will all take together in the coming years as we gather um, in the next few years to mark the anniversary of other milestones on the road to independence and in 2026, the 250th anniversary of our nation's founding, we will have plenty of opportunities to think deeply about our founding story and the role that it plays in binding us together and defining who we are as a people. So I want to charge each of you to lean into that work. Be curious, ask questions, learn, be thoughtful about how you tell the story, right? 
see our founding history as the precious resource it is, a tool to help us define ourselves and to imagine the country we want to live in, the community we want to build, the ideals that can inform that work. Think of yourself and think of your role differently. The many members of our founding generation gave us a set of questions. You've heard many speakers tonight state those questions, and we are still grappling with those questions today. I think we will always be grappling with those questions, how our voices can be heard, what our recourse is when we don't have access to the power to make decisions that shape our lives. So it's up to us, all of us, together, to find the answers that are right for our own time. In a sense, we are all revolutionaries, so own that. Own it, live it, join the conversation, do the work, make change. Thank you. As I was saying, <laughs> little Sally Waters, sitting in the saucer, ride Sally, ride Sally, wipe away your tears, Sally, turn to the east, turn to the west, turn to the one that you love the best. I was a little girl here in Boston, right up there on Northampton Street. I was taught Boston is the hub of the universe. It was bludgeoned into us from kindergarten on. I thought, of course, little Sally Walter. But you see, that time and that place, I never saw me. The visions that I saw were other little girls, preferably with long, long locks. I never saw me in my Boston that was given to me. Turn to the east, turn to the west. You see, at that time I was taught there was no place here for me. I had to learn that I had to take it. I learned from the folks in the South End, the movers in South End, those who moved our city, Mel King, uncle to me. My mother, Marlene Stevens, community activist, and that little girl with very short hair and fat face learned that this is mine. As I said earlier, folks who came before me bought this for me through their work and their sweat and their lives. This is mine. Reality check. I had a little girl come up to me uh, about a week ago and said, why don't I see myself here? Shocked me. I felt the same way 60 years ago. There is a place here. I love my city, but now I understand my city. Wall Street losing dough everywhere. They blaming it on long hair. Big men smoking in their easy chair on a fat cigar without a care. That's what makes this world go round. The ups and downs, the carousel. People make this world go round. People make this world go round. I've learned to tell that little brown girl sitting there in the back of my heart, baby girl, it's going to be all right. 
reality check. It's not what hope gave me, but we all have power here. And I've heard everybody talk about power and creating change, but we do it all together. Don't pick one street, the other street, the other road. Move together to do this change. I love this city. Little Sally Waters sitting in the saucer. We can do it all together for that little fat-faced little girl. And for that little girl two weeks ago said she didn't belong here. People make this world go round. Give yourselves a hand for what you're doing for this city. Come on. <laughs> it's a strange city, but I love the quirkiness, the conversation, and the lack of R's. Who needs an R? <laughs> ah, who needs an R? I, that's the ox a accent. Who needs an R? I don't need an R. <laughs> With all of this, my heart, I give to you love, understanding. To all the speakers, I say thank you so much. The little girl in my heart is saying, keep doing what you're doing. Little Sally Waters, sitting in the saucer. Smile, Sally, smile, Sally. Wipe away your tears. Turn to the east. Turn to the West, turn to the one that you love the best. People make this world go round. Take care. I don't know what's happening now. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to do a little audible here, uh, and uh, I want to honor uh, the the effort that our last speaker put into actually making it through uh, the the uh, traffic that was caused by the protests. And um, I would like to invite um, Representative Aaron Michlowitz to share his thoughts with us tonight. So I'm just gonna say uh, a quick word of introduction um, to, to introduce him before I invite him to come up on the stage. Um, uh, born and raised uh, here in the north end of Boston. Uh, he represents that neighborhood, but also uh, portions of the downtown here um, and has served in the Massachusetts legislature since 2009. Um, throughout his tenure, uh, Chair Mike Witz has dedicated himself to lifting up the many and varied voices of his district and improving the quality of life for each and every one of his constituents. Um, he's a longtime uh, youth coach and mentor, a community leader, an environmental stalwart. Um, he became the chair of the House Ways and Means Committee in 2019, in which uh, capacity he has led the stewardship of our state's finances with prudence, uh, a care, and foresight. His work in all respects reflects his commitment to the great traditions and history of our city and state and his support for revolutionary spaces as a place-based center for historical interpretation, civic education and community engagement has been instrumental in our stewardship of both the Old State House and the Old South Meeting House, these two important historic sites here at the heart of uh, his legislative district. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Representative Aaron Michlowitz to lead us out tonight. <laughs> Thank you, and uh, I apologize for being late. Uh, I did, I was coming, I was actually with Sagun's boss, uh, the mayor, over at the New Market Square uh, holiday uh, uh, event that they were having, and I figured it would take me about 15, 20 minutes to get from one space to the other. Uh, that did not happen uh, because of the, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the protests that were going on. I actually found it ironic that I was 
late for this event, which was obviously honoring the 250th anniversary of the Boston Tea Party because of a protest uh, that was actually happening in the streets of Boston. Uh, so the whole uh, irony of it is, uh, is, is uh, not lost on me. But I, I did want to say uh, I'm very honored uh, to represent this district, uh, represent this area, uh, because of the, uh, uh, the, the, not just obviously the neighborhoods that I get to represent, but because of the rich history uh, that comes with that. Uh, and uh, the old state house, the old South Meeting House, uh, uh, a lot, the freedom, the majority of the Freedom Trail, uh, these are the things that I get, I get to uh, call my home and, and, and speak about when I go to uh, talk about with my colleagues around the Commonwealth exactly uh, how we need to uh, not just talk about the future, but recognize the past and, and recognize the things that are, uh, uh, you know, that have made this, this city and this state great. And, um, you know, it's something I'm very honored to get to do. I get to be, uh, as the Chair of Ways and Means, get to be, uh, you know, have a little influence in terms of trying to provide some resources in that direction as well. Uh, uh, and it's something that I, I truly enjoy, and I want to. I just want to also congratulate all the all the uh, awardees tonight, uh, folks that I've known, uh, I've watched, uh, or have either watched or known in different spaces. Uh, particularly Ar Arlene, uh, who has been a dear friend uh, in many different fights up at the state house that we've had, uh, and uh, I couldn't do a lot of the work without her. Uh, you know, in, in, uh, whether it was uh, reproductive rights or LGBTQ rights, uh, things that you know are the, the the bedrock of a lot of the things that we we fight for up at the state house. Um, um, I, I, I can't go without recognizing the fact that the Boston Tea Party Museum is right in the middle of, of obviously, uh, Four Point Channel, which is right down the middle of both my district and David Beale's district. Uh, we like to fight over uh, who actually represents uh, the quote-unquote Tea Party, uh, which is, uh, which is um, you know, a little back and forth that we have. But as the chair weighs it means, I'm going to take it for, for tonight. Uh, I'm going I'm to usurp it and, uh, and make it mine. Uh, but I just want to thank everyone for, for their hard work, uh, not just at Revolutionary Spaces, uh, but overall in, in, the, in, the, in the Boston community for their, their hard work of making sure that we, uh, you know, highlight the things. And, and, and you know, obviously, these spaces are what bring a lot of people to the city uh, and bring a lot of people to the Commonwealth. And uh, we need to make sure that we continue to treasure them. So I appreciate being here. I'm sorry again that I was late. And thank you for having me uh, close this thing out. All right. Have a good night. Thank you. Well, thank you all for your flexibility, and thanks again to our uh, wonderful honorees. Thank you all for being here, um, and I look forward to seeing you back in this space again very soon. Have a great night.